Okay, good morning or good afternoon, um, depending on where you're at in the country. And thank you for attending um, this co-sponsored seminar with the Iowa State Bar Association and the Center for Agriculture Law and Taxation. Our goal here today is to just give you some basics um, on the new law. There's a lot of areas that we're going to have to go into that are a little bit more technical, probably later, because there's still a lot of guidance we need. And we'll try to give you a heads up on some of the issues, and we have gotten um, and received some guidance on others. So let's get started here. There'll be three polling questions, and um, I'll let Christy um, uh, Cronin, pardon me, um, uh, uh, load those when the time is right. So I'm going to talk about individual, and you can see my email on the screen, and Christine Tigran, our staff attorney, is going to talk about the business portion. Now, as for questions, um, you can put them in the question box, that's fine, but for consistency, we're going to take as many questions as we can at the end, and um, then we'll put together a document um, for your use addressing all of the questions, okay? So, we're going to look at individual and employer issues, and as I said, we're not going to be able to catch everything, but we'll do the best we can. Now, the law does have a sunset period after eight years, and this was signed into law on December 22nd. It's the House Bill 1 called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and these go for an eight-year period beginning in 2018 through 2025. And instead of repealing some of the provisions, they suspended them through this eight year period. So there are some um, things that were repealed, but the majority of them were suspended. So it could be that, uh, well, a lot of things can happen between now and then, but it could be eventually we would go back to the law as we currently know it for 2017. Um, but as I said, a lot can happen between now and then. So the first thing we want to look at is what impacts the 2017 um, tax returns that they're all getting um, ready to file um, and discuss those. And the first one is there's a two-year time frame uh, where we're still going to have to deal with the Affordable Care Act as it applies to individuals and applying the penalties. Now, the Affordable Care Act has not been repealed. Um, it's still in force. And uh, they still must have minimal essential coverage or have an exemption from the penalty. Uh, the penalty will apply for the 2017 and the 2018 year. And then when we get into 2019, the penalty will be reduced to zero. This is for individuals. And the mandate still is in place for them to have insurance. Now, when it comes to the employer, and the employer um, criteria that you can see in the two, the two bullets on your screen there, there has been no change to that at all. Uh, basically, if you have between 50 and 90 time full-time employees, you had to comply in the tax year 2016. Okay, something wrong? Okay. Someone says they're not seeing. So we're making a little adjustment here. There we go. There, there we go. Okay. Um, and let me go back one here. And if you had at least 100 full-time employees and beyond that amount, then you had 2015 to comply. No changes with this. As far as we know, penalties will still be assessed uh, and no changes. So those employers still have to comply, and there are still penalties associated with that. And here's the criteria. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it because nothing has really changed. But I did want you to know that for ACA uh, individual, we're looking at a two-year time frame. For ACA and the criteria for employees uh, and employers, um, as it relates to employers, has not changed. Also, 1095s are going to be issued. Uh, for uh, by insurance companies and by employers, and as IRS did last year, they delayed that required filing until uh, from January 31st until March 2nd. Okay, so those forms, the 1095Bs and Cs, will be coming a little bit late to your clients. Also, one of the changes for 2017 and 18 now uh, is the medical deductions. 
we were supposed to have um, a 10% amount. That has now been um, retroactive back, and we the threshold amount remains at 7.5%. Uh, any amount above 7.5% 7 .5 of AGI is deductible as a medical expense on Schedule A. Schedule A is not going to go away. It's just going to be modified. Once we get into 2019, and beyond, then we have the 10% amount that we have to deal with. Now, IRS has, has issued the new withholding tables in notice um, uh, 1036. Uh, it's the percentage method. I've been asked uh, about the Pub 15 because many small employers like to use that in the tables inside. It has The Pub 15 has been pulled from the draft site. Usually when they pull it from the draft site, that generally means, can't know for sure, but within five to seven days, it shows up on the main irs.gov uh, website as an official 2018 document, okay? So we're monitoring that. Now, we've taken away per, uh, personal exemptions, and we've increased standard deductions and made some changes to itemized deductions, but IRS said that um, they don't have to worry about uh, a new W-4. Um, People who have already filled out the W-4 do not need to fill out a new one, although there's some concern uh, under discussion on the internet about that. Uh, here is the notice on the percentage tables uh, that you can use until the, um, the other more simplified tables come out. Here's a draft of the W-4, okay? You can see that there's a lot of X's on there. It's still a draft form. Uh, it is, the last update was done in August for the draft and it is still on the website for drafts, so I don't expect it anytime soon, but um, one never knows. Uh, we're monitoring at the call, um, call to offices. Our due date, and this is all to kind of prepare you for 2017's filing season, is April 17th uh, because of Emancipation Day in the District of Columbia. Now, I've got a lot of questions in uh, the office about tuition and fees. That expired at the end of 2016, and it was not included in this tax uh, bill. So uh, that is basically gone, and the place on the front of the 1040 is reserved. Now, this wasn't announced until I really saw the 1040 instructions. There was um, a, a, a regulation that came out on some changes of dependence, but it wasn't really clear until I saw the instructions. And if you look at the qualifying widower or widow, uh, they used to have down there, um, and you can see in the top part, a copy of the 16 form, it says with dependent child. Now there's some changes to that, and you can see what the 17 draft looks like there. Um, and now they say see instructions. Well, the instructions basically say this. They give you the test for the qualifying widow or widower, um, and those are, have remained unchanged as far as some of the tests. Um, and they want, instead of um, claiming it like you used to, if indeed that child can't claim, be claimed as a dependent, they want that child entered all up above in the head of household line where you would normally put a child who's not claim, uh, claimed as a dependent under head of household. If you don't enter the name, IRS is stating that it will delay the processing of the return. So um, just check the instructions, watch your software, uh, hopefully they will um, direct you to the right area. And there's a little bit more here about that that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. 1099 reporting, remember non-employee compensation box 7 is due to the IRS by January 31st and also to the recipients. Uh, W-2s are also due January 31st, okay? Um, also, granting extensions is going to be pretty hard to, um, to get an extension. About the only extensions I've seen go through successfully have been for disaster purposes. Also, if you have clients living in these states, and you can read those yourself, there's been a change in where you mail the return if indeed you're not electronically filing. So make a note of that, um, and it makes a difference whether they're getting a refund or a payment. But hopefully you'll file electronically. Um, it, it's a little bit, um, you know IRS has received the documents. 
Now, there are some changes with the 2017 when it comes to disasters for certain persons in certain areas. This usually applies to Harvey, Irma, and the Maria hurricanes. And it was part of the 17 disaster bill. Now, we didn't have direction on this until just a couple days ago, as a matter of fact. And um, on what we did know is they don't have to be able to itemize to claim the casualty. It's added to the standard deduction for 2017. So um, it, it's basically taken off um, uh, the Schedule A for 17. And you'll see some changes in 16 and 18 as we go forward here. Here's an example of Mary. What they're allowing them to do is to claim their prior year income, if it was higher, to maybe uh, qualify for child tax credit or earned income credit at a higher level. And you can see the example here, single mother with two kids. The restaurant she worked at was destroyed. She became unemployed. Uh, her income was reduced uh, to 10,000 a year. Um, and but her income from the prior year was more. That has that's a criteria that has to be there. It was fifteen thousand. It qualifies qualifies her for um, a bigger earned income credit and maybe more refundable uh, child tax credit. But we didn't know how this was going to apply, and we finally got that. Um, I think it was early this week or last week. Basically, you put the abbreviation PYEI, prior year earned income, and your software should accommodate this. Online 66A, sorry, um, it went down into the red, but there'll be a little dotted space there and next to line 66A, and if this applies, now remember, it only applies to certain people, not nationally, okay, for the tax year 2017. It had to be located in a presidentially declared disaster area on the specific dates that apply to those hurricanes. Okay, it's time for a polling question here. And um, we'll let Christy uh, load that, and then we'll get on with 2018 to 2025 changes. So everyone take some time to vote. Okay, we're closing the poll and sharing your um, answers. Are we going to share? Or, yeah, okay. We have 39% lawyers. 39% are attorneys. 27% are CPAs that are attending today. 27% are CPAs. 15% are tax preparers. 15% are tax preparers. And 16% are enrolled agents. 16% rolled agents. And 3% office staff today. Okay, and 3% office staff. Great, we have a good variety. So let's go ahead and let's talk about the changes that are going to affect 2018 through this um, short window through 2025, where some of our laws are now suspended and replaced with these. First of all, our old law, prior law, what we're working on right now for 2017, had six tax brackets, or I should say six, six rates, tax rates, with the, the five tax brackets that you see there, four for individual, and then we had our estates and trust. What they've done is made those now seven tax rates. They maintain the bracket beginning points, but they're the span of those brackets are somewhat different. And just um, because you think your client's in a lower tax bracket, there's too many other changes to determine whether there's going to be savings based on just the tax bracket. So keep that in mind. Uh, each bracket was adjusted between one and four points, and you can see um, percentage points, and you can see those. And, and uh, I think there's been so much publicity about it being a lower tax bracket. Many people are going to think they're going to save, but 
you'll see as we go through this, um, that's not easy to um, determine. Now the standard deduction has increased and it's doubled um, basically um, pretty close to doubling. You can see those figures on your screen. Those will be adjusted for inflation after 2018. And nothing was changed. If one person itemizes, the other one still needs to itemize. That, that requirement never changed. So um, if one itemizes, both have to itemize on a joint return. Unchanged. Now, what did um, remain also the same was the additional standard deduction. And this is for 2018 and beyond. Um, they still get, even though a married couple gets 24000 they can get the additional standard deduction as well. And the amounts have been pretty much the same over the past few years. But in 18, because of inflation, you'll notice in the last two bullets, uh, the, the, pardon me, the last three bullets, that they're going to increase in 2018. Uh, for 17, they're $1,550. Uh, $1, and in, um, for the uh, single and head of household, and in married uh, filing joint, it's uh, $12,250. $1, okay? uh, nothing changed with the age or, or how it's calculated, but they couldn't get an additional standard deduction on top of the normal standard deduction beginning in 18. Now, um, also, our filing requirements, how do you determine whether a person is required to file a return also changed because that determination was made using the additional standard deduction, the standard deduction in the personal exemption. Um, and we're getting rid of the personal exemptions for this span of eight years. So our current filing requirements you see on your screen and you would add the additional standard deduction uh, to that to determine the filing requirements. So we'll get new tables um, to explain that later on um, in the year. Here's an example of Joe, he's 70 years old, he gets the basic, he's single, and then he's over 65, therefore he gets additional 1600, therefore he has to file at 13.6. As I stated, personal exemptions are gone. They're not repealed, they're suspended during this eight year time frame. And there's a big difference. Um, lots of times uh, they talk about repealing this and that, um, but they've suspended this. So this could come back. Also, um, the personal exemption is used in very, uh, in many other code sections, such as determining what uh, amount to levy um, from wages. Uh, it's used in withholding tables, those sorts of things, uh, as well as the personal exemption, the child tax credit, that sort of thing. Now, this, the personal exemption, if it had remained for 2018, it would have been $4,150. Okay. That still, for all of your code sections, remains in effect for making certain determinations, like um, exemption deduction from qualified disability trust wage withholding, and also uh, property level exemptions. Uh, and another one, they use it also in the child tax credit and that sort of thing. So they've just suspended the exemption from being on the tax return, but they're still using the exemption to calculate other credits and other aspects um, that apply to the exemption. Now the kitty tax has changed, and this was one where um, I studied a little bit, and finally um, the light bulb uh, went off. Basically, we're going to uh, a different type of taxation. Now, in before, it applies to children under 19 or 24 for full-time student, and they have unearned income. In, in 16 and 17, that amount would have been 2,100. Now, um, and, uh, pardon me, and also 18. Uh, so then they're subject to this kitty tax. But what they've done, instead of it being taxed at the parent's rate, um, now the earned income is going to be taxed at the child's rate, and the unearned income is going to be taxed at trust rates. Well, there's no um, zero rate, really, on trusts. So any amount not over um, 10, uh, 2550, 2550, um, is going to be taxed at 
10%. So really, they're going to be taxed on the very first dollar of unearned income. Okay, so that's a significant change. Then it goes up to 24, 35, and eventually to 37%. So there might be some tax planning uh, opportunities here with education accounts and things like that that you might want to look into because uh, earned income is going to be taxed on first dollar um, based on the tax tables. No significant change to capital gains. Um, the break points have changed, and you can see those on your screen, but pretty much everything else applies except, and I'm kind of getting into the business area here, but there was um, uh, an, uh, the issue with uh, a break point for the 25% maximum for unrecaptured 1250 property and a 28% bracket for capital gains. Those remain in force. Okay, uh, those remain unchanged. So, and you notice this is just reinforcing the sunset and the eight year time span. Child tax credit changed significantly, and uh, not only the credit itself, but the span um, associated with the credit. Uh, as far as, um, for example, the 400,000 you're seeing on the screen used to be 110,000, and the 200,000 you're seeing on your screen used to be 75. So they've expanded those phase out amounts and the amounts now at $2,000. There's no adjustment for inflation and no credit will be allowed if indeed uh, there's no social security number. Also, there's a refundable portion and you can see that on your screen. It will be in that part will be indexed for inflation. And they decreased the, re, um, the credit threshold, or earned income threshold, I should say, down to 2,500, which will make increased refundable portions available for your clients. Now, this one, I have it in red because we need some guidance on. Um, they also created a non-refundable $500 credit for certain qualifying children that weren't dependents. And there's been um, quite a bit of discussion in some of the texts and online, and I think where they're coming from is probably pretty accurate, but I would still like to see something from IRS on guidance. So it could be, it may be, the regulations will uh, clarify this, I hope, that any child over age 17 could get a partial credit, okay, because they didn't qualify for um, uh, the dependent status or, uh, or a qualifying child under the other rules. And it could be other qualifying non-children, relatives that could possibly, um, that sort of thing. But we definitely need guidance on this. Now, state and local tax deductions, limited. There's two limitations, 10,000 for all taxpayers except married filing separately. That's limited to 5,000. So adding your state income tax withheld, if it's there. If it's not there, adding your sales tax. Um, your real estate property taxes and any personal income tax and, your, and that sort of thing, they're limited by 10,000 for everyone except married filing separate is limited to 5,000. Foreign real property taxes don't apply. This is going to be a, a really bad hit for like um, states like California and New York who have very high tax brackets and they're not going to be able to deduct that as an itemized deduction and it remains an itemized deduction. Also, it's very clear at the end of the year that you cannot prepay your state tax in order to take a deduction in 17 because you paid it. Um, you still make your regular state estimated tax payments for the 17 year but you can't prepay into 18. Now, there was so much discussion about this. I included this in here because we retain, there was no change to the exclusion of gain from the sale of a principal residence. They were talking about five out of seven years that never uh, passed. It was um, pretty much left alone in the committee uh, reconciliation. We are still at two out of five years, and the exclusion remains the same. Now, mortgage and home equity. Basically, these equity loans are pretty much down the tubes, okay? Uh, and they're also limiting the deductible mortgage debt um, interest on, on, on this uh, for any new loans after 1214. 
Uh, and you can see 750,000 and 300,000 in filing separately. Any current loans are grandfathered in under that cap as long as they kept, uh, they were under the $1 million cap that was um, uh, in law in 2017. Uh, and also they can refinance up to um, any mortgage debt that existed on before this law changed and up to a million and still be able to deduct an interest as long as the new loan does not exceed the mortgage being refinanced. So you refinance to get a cheaper loan, interest rate, fine, but any equity added onto that, the interest is not deductible. So it, it's going to be curious to see how banks are going to report this. There is a binding contract um, area too. If you had people who uh, entered into a contract and uh, they weren't able to close, so if, um, there is that in the law. Mortgage credit certificates remain unchanged, uh, just to kind of uh, round out that part of the of the law. Now, charitable deductions. There was some confusion about this early on that I addressed. Uh, probably because a lot of us don't forget there was another law that passed, uh, the, the Pension Act that passed a few years back that made some changes to our substantiation requirements for charitable contributions. What the new law has done for, um, it's changed the 50% limitation to 60% for certain public charities and private foundations, okay? The carry forward is still up to five years subject to later any ceiling caps. But where the confusion came in is what um, Congress did is they repealed an old law in this Pension Protection Act that passed, I think it was in 2005 or 2006, maybe sooner. Um, but your clients still must have contemporaneous document, written, written acknowledgments prior to filing their tax return, okay? Um, of their charitable contributions or IRS will not allow the deduction. And also, they must have certain wording about no exchange for goods and services and things like that. What Congress repealed, uh, and this is a repeal, not a sunset, they repealed a, the DONI exception. So let me give you an example. Um, the Pension Act said if the, the Donor organization, the person your client contributed the, the money to, reported that on their 990 and revealed your client's social security number and the amount and all of that, um, then the client didn't have to have the contemporaneous written documentation. But IRS never really issued any regulations. Uh, they didn't address it. They just said, you know, okay, part of that is this was never implemented. They want the contemporaneous documentation. That's what was repealed. The donor's requirement to have the contemporaneous documentation remains in effect. And a, your best publication to give your um, individual clients is publication 1771. College athletic seating, you used to be able to deduct 80% of that uh, as a charitable contribution to higher education. That is gone, completely gone. Alimony is also um, repealed after 2018, so we have a window of opportunity, maybe, for some of your clients, that neither have to report it as income or uh, the other uh, half does not get a deduction. And this would affect anyone currently paying um, alimony. Now, uh, just a statement here. As I went through the individual aspects, one thing I noticed is that Congress centered on auditable things, high audit issues like alimony, like miscellaneous itemized deductions. Um, and this is the one that seems to have upset uh, everyone along with that 20% qualified business income issue. Anything that qualifies as a miscellaneous itemized deduction beginning in 2018 is gone. It's suspended during this eight year time frame. And you can see some of the issues that um, are going to be impacted there. So you've got to watch what is subject to the 2% floor, what is not subject to the 2% floor. Gambling is not, and there's been a change to that as well. So you'll want to check that. We have another exception there. If the repayments are greater than 3,000, it's 
it's not subject to the 2% floor, but if it's uh, less than 3,000, um, then it is subject to the 2% floor, okay? That means any truck driver who's an employee and he, he or she does not get reimbursed for meals no longer has a deduction. That means that if Iowa State pays me 27 cents a mile to drive to the speech, and the IRS is, I believe it's 54 cents a mile, uh, I might be, I don't have that in the brain yet, uh, I can't deduct the difference. Anything uh, with that, rural mayor carriers are gone, union dues, lock boxes, uh, tax returns, hobby loss, all of that is gone, suspended during this eight year period. Also, the phase out of itemized deductions is, is suspended during this time frame. That's going to help the higher income. That usually um, caused more tax to be um, paid, so it's going to help the higher income. Moving expense deductions are also suspended by on the individual basis and also on the employer reimbursement basis. Employers can no longer reimburse their employees. If they do, it is taxable income, and employees can no longer deduct it as an adjustment to income. The only exception is the armed forces change of duty station. AMT, notice the increases in um, the exemptions. The law is pretty much intact as to what it was there, just um, increase in exemptions and phase out amounts. Uh, and you can see that here. And this is effective for 2018, giving you a little bit more information. Notice that um, exemption uh, amount of under $1 million. Um, So that's going to be really helpful. Okay, Section 529, several changes. One has to apply with tuition programs as they apply to expenses to private, um, public, and religious elementary and secondary schools. No definition change on that. And that 10,000 applies per student, okay? ABLE accounts made some significant changes. Um, the, what this amounts to is it's always been limited to the gift tax amount. I noticed the gift tax amount went to 15,000 in 2018, okay? Um, now the designated beneficiary can contribute above and beyond that. Let me see, if I do have the figures here, so. Hold on just a minute. Won't have those completely memorized. Um, but the threshold amount, uh, they can go above and beyond that. And it has to be the lesser of the federal poverty line for one person or their compensation. So if they don't work, it's going to fall on the federal poverty line. Now, for 18, I have the federal poverty line figures. And they're different for the continental United States versus Alaska and Hawaii. The figures for 18 for Alaska are $15,060. For Hawaii, it's $13,860. And for the continental United States, it's $12,060, okay? So they can contribute up to the lesser of that, those amounts in their respective areas or their compensation. They also, um, uh, made the ABLE account beneficiary responsible to make sure no over contributions are done. That falls on their shoulders now. Um, and they also made those contributions eligible for the savers credit. This is effective uh, for distributions of the date of enactment. Um, uh, they can uh, they are allowed to roll over um, amounts to an able count without penalty. Uh, so, but the, the, this made no sense to me. They, they are counted, those rollovers are counted towards the contributions. So we're gonna have to watch that carefully. Okay, the recharacterization of a traditional IRA uh, contribution to a Roth, um, Basically, the new law eliminates the ability to do recharacterizations, okay? Um, but we have now received some guidance just in the last few days. It can be done to unwind a Roth conversion, but, and this is from the IRS website, an individual can make a contribution for a year to a Roth, and before the due date of the return, recharacterize it as a contribution to an IRA. 
and they may still contribute to the traditional IRA and convert that to the traditional uh, IRA to a Roth or um, uh, and, uh, precludes later um, unwinding it. So um, what has happened is if you do this on the 17 tax return, they want to recharacterize. You have until October 15th to do that recharacterization, October 15th of 2018. Okay, because it was contributed in 2017. Any contributions for 2018 and beyond, basically the recharacterization is gone. Uh, this is a long time coming. There were several, uh, probably up to 20 bills about the taxability of discharge of student loan indebtedness. It is no longer um, taxable on death or disability. That's a good thing. Also, we have added due diligence requirements to the head of household um, uh, category filing status and penalties. So uh, I imagine the form 8867, uh, the due diligence uh, column will be added for head of household. Now, personal casualty and theft losses is suspended except if indeed it's declared as a federal declared disaster area. And you can see in the new rules, it's subject to a $100 per casualty adjustment. And this is during this suspended time frame, 18 to, two, uh, to 2025, and that 10% uh, is uh, still retained AGI for the federally declared area. Now, there's um, a new exception for uh, with Casually gains orders does matter between these time frames. So you could have a personal casualty loss and you could have um, a personal casualty gain. You can offset those. Um, and you could have a non federal personal casualty loss as well. So you offset those with the federally declared disaster. And I'll give you an example here in a minute. Um, but you can't, the losses cannot exceed gains. And then they'll be subject to that 10% figure. So let's look at an example. Here we have Sally. She has three different kinds of losses, a non-federal casualty loss, a federal casualty loss, and a personal casualty gain. So we start with the non-federal. Um, it's 15000 We have to reduce our gain by that because it's a loss. Uh, so we have zero losses remaining. We still have a net gain of 5000 though. That has to reduce our federally disaster loss, qualified federally disaster loss. So that reduces that loss to 40,000. Then we need to look at our AGI, okay, which her AGI was 150,000. 10% of that is 15,000. Therefore, our deductible federal disaster area loss will be 25,000. So what about excess losses? They cannot exceed gains, so they're basically just lost. As far as we know, though, it's lost for that particular year. As far as we know, though, and we probably need to really get some clarification on this, um, whether or not they can create an NOL, okay? Um, the NOLs are limited, and Christine, I assume, will talk about that as, as we go forward. The carryback um, has been eliminated. You can only carry them forward, but you can carry them indefinitely. So um, I assume we could still create the NOL um, in a federally declared area. Um, not, we can't have losses exceeding personal casualty losses, exceeding personal casualty gains. So we need some clarification on that. And here's a little bit on the NOL since I did mention it, and I'm sure Christine is going to talk about it a little bit more. One of the things you're going to have to do is distinguish between the two different kinds of NOL so. Now, they did make some changes to 2016 disasters. So we'll have to go back to FEMA.gov and see what disasters were federally declared in 2016. And you can see um, when we look at the 2016 and 2017 rules here in these next few slides, um, they're pretty much similar, okay? And, and we've known about the 17 disaster rules for quite some time, the uh, alleviation of the 10% penalty, the rollovers, um, the three-year distribution period, um, the casualty loss limitation doesn't apply, the 100 was changed to 500, et cetera. 
And we see the same thing with the Disaster Relief Act of 17. So um, the 16 wasn't there before. That's retroactive. So you may have some clients who had something in 16 that could, um, you know, take advantage of these new requirements or these new laws that were created with the Act in 16. Okay. And uh, there's, the provisions are very similar. The only exception with the 2017 law that passed in September was this EITC, the last bullet there that we covered briefly, so you would be aware how to handle that in the earlier section, um, and the earned income tax credit. But their income has to be higher in uh, 16 than it was in 17 for that to qualify. Also, um, if they have a new disaster loss between 15 and 15, 16, and pardon me, 16 and 17, the AMT adjustment for the standard deduction doesn't apply, even though it increases the standard deduction. So watch that. <coughs> you want to make sure that you catch that. And here's an example. Um, they had a thousand dollar qualified disaster loss. Their standard deduction in 17 would have been 6350. Uh, they can add that to the standard deduction, so now it becomes 7350. Uh, and the AMT um, has no, um, it, 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 it's not used in determining um, the AMT. So just to kind of summarize, watch, we've got 16, we got, and we got 17. Um, so, and those you could add to um, the standard deduction to increase the, the, the loss and take advantage of it. They don't need to atomize, in other words, to take these deductions. Gambling losses, also a uh, very small change. They are not subject to the 2%, so we don't have to worry about that. But what Congress did is it included in the wording, it said all deductions, which includes lodging and fees and things like that that you had to pay in order to gamble. So those become part of your losses. And remember, losses up to gains, um, uh, nothing in excess of that. There's no carry forward provisions. Okay, entertainment. I need to make a statement on entertainment because we're not sure exactly where this is all going to go. So first of all, we've got to look at the rules that were in place. And I want to talk a little bit about those rules. There was the one for, and I'm really going to center on meals here for right now, as it, enter, as it relates to the entertainment. The criteria was twofold. One, you get your meals if you're away from home overnight. No problem. The other one was the meal is a business-related entertainment. Entertainment, um, um, they had to, you had to prove it was directly related or associated with the conduct of business. And they defined uh, that uh, or business income producing activity, okay? And generally that deduction was limited to 50%. Now if we look at the language in the tax cut um, section, and it's section 13304 of that bill, if you're interested, it states that taxpayers, and I'm going to read here because I don't have this completely memorized yet, taxpayers may still generally, and I hate it when they use the word generally because that means there's always an exception, okay, deduct 50% of the food and beverage expenses associated with operating their trade or business. Generally is defined as um, um, in, in a particular matter, such as in disregard of a specific incident or the overall picture, or usually. Okay, and then um, by example, they use the meals. Well, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act provides that no deduction is allowed with respect to an activity generally considered to be entertainment. By going back and looking at the original law, um, this means it could mean that meals could be deducted, could not be deducted when applying this second provision because they're going to be under the entertainment provision. And that provision was the meal is business-related entertainment. Therefore, um, we need guidance and um, stay tuned on that. So now we're going to go through the entertainment expenses that are suspended, directly related or associated with the conduct of your trade or business. Uh, and hopefully we'll get some clarification on meals that apply to entertainment. 
Also, the prior law allowed no deduction for membership dues, uh, private clubs, pleasure, recreation, uh, any type of club. That is unchanged, okay? Also, it, uh, if you could approve a directly related or associated expense, you could get the 50% um, uh, limitation. But there's a code section 274E, and you really need to look at that because there are several exceptions to this entertainment expense. And so you've got to look at that very, very carefully. Okay, and these are some of the um, uh, related expenses that are under those exceptions. Now, the expenses for recreational, social, or similar activities primarily for the benefit of the employees other than certain highly compensated employees, that's an exception to 274E. Uh, from what I read, Congress didn't change 274E, so that social birthday party, you went out and maybe bought a birthday cake for an employee, I don't see a problem with that, okay? But when you get into other things that are disguised as compensation, you get into another part of the law. So review 274E, here are more exceptions, uh, stockholder meetings, um, employee business meetings, things like that. Uh, I'm right now just concerned about how IRS is going to interpret the law and meals for entertainment, that quiet business meal, not away from home overnight. Um, I think we need clarification on it, okay? And as I'm, I'm quoting here, directly related or associated, that's been suspended, uh, and watch your exceptions there. Now, the meals fall under Section 274K. It's still there, but I don't know what impact taking away the directly related or associated 50% amount will have on the meals. So these, all these provisions have been eliminated through the suspension, okay? Club as an entertainment, uh, tickets to sporting events, entertainment, play, skyboxes, you know, the charitable sporting event issue, um, these are all gone. Okay, now also they limit beginning in 2018 um, the operating the cafeteria in the place of business used to be a 100%. Now it's going down to 50%. Um, I can't find anything that the meals have been repealed, but I don't like the wording in the committee reports. Okay? So um, probably overdid that one. Okay, please note, employ business expenses that are not reimbursed, and I stated this before, you could always take those on the 2106. You cannot take them anymore. A lot of things are disappearing under miscellaneous itemized deductions. So those accountable plans, if employers put them in place, become golden for the employee. I wanted to include a few things about what did not change because there was so much discussion on the internet about we're going to take this away, we're going to take that away, we're going to limit this, we're going to limit that. The student loan interest remains a deduction on the front of the tax return. No changes with that. Same with the adoption assistance to programs at the employer level as well as, the, um, as um, an individual level. Dependent care accounts, they were thinking about taking away that 5,000 deferred. Uh, they're still in place. The tuition waivers for like education institutions um, and themselves, spouse and dependents remains unchanged. The employer paid tuition remains unchanged at the 5250, and the credit for the elderly was also retained. Teachers can still take the $250 deduction. <coughs> Pardon me. There was a time where uh, one of the branches was talking about 500, they retained the 250. So you might need to clarify that. The 401k break, uh, they were going to limit that to a deferral um, of income tax up to 2500. That really um, upset a lot of people. Um, it remains unchanged. So we're at 18.5 for this year. Electric cars remain unchanged. Uh, medical savings accounts remain unchanged. Uh, the user fee for installment agreements and how they um, calculate the user fee remains unchanged. They were going to take away the exclusion for incarcerated individuals wrongly convicted. That remains unchanged. And both the American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning Credit remain unchanged. So this is just kind of a review of that. Um, I hear employee discounts, also they were gonna take that away and it's generally 
It can't go beyond 20%. Um, that remains unchanged. Group term life insurance, that remains unchanged as well. Health savings account, the exempt from income, um, those remain unchanged. Any additional cost services and working condition fringes also remain unchanged. The changes they did to the fringe benefits were de minimis fringe for the convenience of the employer um, will, uh, uh, is, will eventually go away after 2025. Um, but they did not repeal, these were all saved, they did not repeal the work opportunity tax credit or certain unused business credits, the new market credits, um, certain credits for individuals who are disabled, um, the TIPS issues, uh, and the adoption assistance program. So uh, all of this remains current law, remains completely unchanged. Okay. Okay, um, do you, is there any burning question I could take before I turn it over to you, Christine? Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Christine and are we gonna do a polling question here real quick? Okay, and Christine's gonna talk about the business issues and thank you for your attention, everyone. So while we're switching speakers, the next polling question is, why are you taking today's webinar? Um, you wanted to find out about the new tax law. You wanted to receive CLE credit. You wanted to receive CPA credit. You wanted to receive IRS credit, or just general knowledge. Um, just take a couple seconds to do that vote at this time. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. It looks like we have 95% that just wanted to know about the new tax law. Awesome. Well, we're going to take it from here. We're going to look at issues that impact businesses. And I'll just preface this by saying if you've dug into this law, which I'm sure many of you have, there are still a lot of unknowns out there. So a lot of what we're talking about today, you know, we're going to talk about what the law says, and there are going to be some issues where we're just not quite sure how IRS is going to interpret the law, and so we're going to uh, point those things out as well. So we can have some good discussions, too, on how different people think that the IRS is going to interpret the law, but we'll probably have to put those off for another day. So I'm going to start today by going through just some changes impacting 2017 returns, because that's the season that you're starting next week. And so we really want to kind of start with the things that changed. There's only a few of them on the business side that kicked in before 2017. Uh, 18 that are going to impact your returns. And so the first one of those, as you're aware, was bonus depreciation. And bonus depreciation uh, changed as of September 27, 2017. So as you're aware, beginning in uh, 2017, we have 100% bonus depreciation. Now this is temporary. It only goes through 2022, which is just over five years, and then it will begin to phase down. And so we'll look at the, what those phase downs are, but essentially what the law says is that the 100% bonus depreciation begins with qualifying property both acquired and placed into service after September 27, 2017. So if you purchase the property on September 27, you're out of luck. If you purchase it on September 28th, you can apply 100% bonus. Now with that, the law also says that taxpayers can continue to elect to use just the 50% bonus for 2017 purchases if they so choose. Um, and of course, at any time, people can elect not to use bonus. Act, the act also provides that additional first year depreciation, which is what we call bonus, also applies to used property. So this is new. This is, 
you know, the technical language was that the use, the original use um, originated with the taxpayer. And that's no longer a requirement uh, with respect to bonus depreciation. So that's a big deal. And that changed for your client's purchases after September 27th. And remember with bonus, it's not just that you acquired it, but that you also placed it into service. So both of those things have to be in place. Now here are the phase outs for bonus, because like I said, most of these provisions um, go into place, uh, the ones that are temporary go into place through 2025. Bonus is different. It, the 100% bonus goes through 2022. Then starting in 2023, we phase down to 80, 2024, we go to 60, 2025 is 40, and in 2026, we're down to 20% bonus. And after that year, this additional first year depreciation ends according to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, with it's important to make the distinction when you're when you're figuring out returns for 2017 is that property acquired before September 28th, so September 27th or before, and placed into service after that date is going to be subject to the pre-tax cuts and Jobs Act phase down limits. So. Remember, we were at 50% bonus in 2017, and that means in 2018, you're going to be looking at the 40%. So those are just a couple of things you have to, to keep in mind as you're dealing with, with property and depreciation, given the new law. Now, Section 179, it changed as well, and this is actually a permanent change. So beginning in 2018, the Act expanded Section 179 to provide an immediate $1 million dollars. Um, deduction. So, you know, 2017, we were looking at a half million roughly, and our phase out hasn't changed that much. Under the new law, we now have a two and a half million threshold where your deduction begins, to, or your expense deduction begins to phase down for Section 179. And these amounts will be indexed for inflation beginning in 2019. So again, with Section 179, it's mostly a doubling of the deduction, and the significant thing really about Section 179 expansion is that it has no sunset date. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about coupling. Most of you are from Iowa, and this is really going to be a big year. So our legislature's in session. Legislators have been talking about what they're going to do. Legislators from all states are kind of trying to figure out how they're going to respond to this massive new tax bill because it really does impose a lot of big choices upon the states. How are they going to respond, right? Are they going to conform to federal law here, here, and here? Um, you know, which provisions are they going to go along with? We're not sure what's going to happen in Iowa. It does appear that for sure we probably won't conform to the $1 million Section 179. We, we didn't even conform to the half million dollar Section 179 last year. Uh, and we've not, we've not conformed with the bonus even when it was at 50%. So it would seem to be impossible that we would conform to the 100% bonus. Um, with that said, where we're at with Iowa law is Iowa law looks at the tax code as it existed on January 1st, 2015. So, you know, it's pretty significantly different already. Then you throw in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and we really have some differences, right? Because we didn't get a lot of the PAP Act provisions that went into place. <coughs> Iowa legislators didn't change Iowa law to conform to those. So what you're going to see is a lot of situations where you have to keep different depreciation schedules for Iowa, for federal, a lot of differences in taxable um, results of, of income. So your, your state tax, you, you perhaps will have a lot more uh, taxable income just based upon the provisions that don't apply to tax law. So the other thing, if you're talking about a C corporation to an S corporation conversion, remember under the PATH Act, Iowa didn't conform to the five-year look back. So for example, in Iowa, we're still dealing with a five-year look back. We also had just some real technical issues with Iowa not coupling with the Section 179. 
caused a lot of headaches for those of you preparing tax returns, helping clients with their businesses, um, you know, caused also some real unfair situations. One of the situations we've been looking into to try to bring to the legislators' attention is the idea that if you are a part of a partnership, for example, where K-1 income comes in from, from out of state, uh, you're many times under this new um, not coupling uh, provision, you are without ability to even get your full depreciation deductions because that amount's not reported and the way that Iowa handles it basically forecloses your ability to even take advantage of reasonable depreciation. So lots of little technical things we're looking at, um, but the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is just going to make that issue even larger. So that'll be a big deal, I think, um, for the state legislature this term. One change that hasn't been talked about a lot, um, because I think a lot of cases people look at it and say, well, it really doesn't make that much difference because we have this increase in, in expensing options, this increase in, in uh, depreciation options, and that is that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act eliminated 1031 like-kind exchange treatment for personal property. Now, as you know, uh, the, the like-kind exchange treatment for real property was retained. So you can still trade a, an office building for a bean field and, and, and get proper 1031 uh, deferred income treatment if you handle it properly, properly using a qualified intermediary. But your personal property trades are no longer going to have Section 1031 available. And so that's a permanent change. And again, like I said, we have now 100% bonus and we have Section 179 at expanded limits. So, you know, in a lot of ways, it's not going to make that much difference. But I do have a couple of slides I want to just discuss what the differences will be and how that might impact some of your clients and just some planning issues that might arise because of that. So just quickly, under the old law, right, when you had like-kind exchange treatment for personal property, as you know, that was mandatory. That was, that was something that had to happen. So if your client went to a dealership and traded a tractor for a planter, the law automatically applied the, the 1031 like-kind exchange treatment for that transaction. So the example here is that in 2017, John trades a tractor with a fair market value of $75,000 and adjusted basis of zero because that's typically how our farm clients operate, right? They've already um, either immediately expensed or fully depreciated these items that they're trading in. They have a basis of zero. They're trading it in for a fair market value of $125,000 plus $50,000 boot. So under the old law, the 1245 recapture was deferred and the basis in the replacement tractor that John got was going to be $50,000. So John could generally then use Section 179 to immediately expense the $50,000 in boot that he paid and that was the way that transaction was handled. Now, now, starting in 2018 with 1031 exchange treatment repealed for uh, personal property, the transaction may have the same net income, but it's going to be handled differently. So in, 27, in 2018, now John tra trades the same tractor with the same fair market value, $75,000, adjusted basis of zero, plus $50,000 boot, for a tractor with a fair market value of $125,000. Same, same exact uh, situation. Now, John has to recognize his $75,000 in recapture, ordinary income, no self-employment tax. John's basis in his new tractor is going to be $125,000, which is the full purchase price of his new tractor. And he can likely use Section 179 to expense this amount fully. And if that's not available, he can use his 100% bonus. Now, even if this tractor that he's purchased is used and not new, remember, he can use bonus depreciation now to purchase used equipment as well. So essentially, uh, tax-wise, net tax-wise, he's not going to have a difference. But choosing to apply higher amounts of 
um, Section 179 or bonus depreciation to offset the increase in the recognized 1245 gain is going to result in lower net Schedule F income, right? Thereby, it's going to reduce his SE income. So that's just a planning consideration because if you're um, not paying self-employment tax, right, you may not be properly preparing for retirement. So it's just something to consider as a discussion point with clients that they may, you know, they may be happy about not having to pay that SE tax, but then again, they need to think about the implications for the future as well. It is kind of also um, important to point out if you're going to have higher amounts of ordinary income being recognized with the 1245 gain being recognized now, the sale and purchase treatment, that might actually be useful in some cases because now maybe you'll have some ordinary income to offset a net operating loss carry forward, forward that you have. Um, so, the, you know, this new treatment might actually be beneficial. Before this change in the law, sometimes people would be really careful not to allow their transactions to be structured as like kind exchanges. And to do that, they typically have to go sell it somewhere else and then purchase the new item from another dealer. And then they could accomplish the same result. Now, essentially, everybody who is trading property is going to be treated that same way. Another issue I think that arises from this is that an accurate trade-in value is now going to be really important. So that's not something that um, we really considered a whole lot before uh, when it was all factored into the 1031 exchange. It wasn't such a big deal. So we're just kind of watching to see if maybe IRS is going to issue some regulations. Maybe there'll be some new reporting requirements. Just one of those extra things to watch for. So on the 2017 returns, the 100% bonus depreciation is available to qualifying property, remember, that's acquired and placed into service after September 27, 2017. And again, this includes used property. So the interesting thing about that is, remember, we are going to have a three-month window where we have 100% bonus and we're going to have that 1031 like-kind exchange treatment still available. So there's, there's one change I especially want to point out because the law also changed a provision that um, used to be in place for bonus. So to kind of accommodate the, the change in law with the like kind exchange treatment. So now section 168 K2E2 applies bonus only to the boot paid in a like kind exchange. So just wanted to highlight that. It's just a little tweak that was made. So it looks at section 179D3, which says the cost of property does not include so much of the basis of such property as is determined by reference to the basis of other property held at any time by the person acquiring such property. So just a little technical point. Um, and this is true whether the taxpayer elects to take the 100% bonus that's available or if they opt to take the 50% bonus, which as I pointed out earlier, you have that option for the first tax year ending after September 27, 2017. So that's section 168 K10 that gives you that additional option. Now, for assets purchased and placed in service before September 28, 50% bonus would still apply to both the boot and the adjusted basis of the relinquished property. Although, as you know, under Section 179, that's only been available um, to apply against the boot. So just a little tweak in the law there. Also, I wanted to remind everybody that after September 27th, you can still continue to elect no bonus depreciation for any class of property. You always have that option. So your clients aren't locked into this new 100% bonus. But remember that once that election is made, it can be revoked only with the consent of IRS. So that's a little different than Section 179, right? You can make 
a, a election, a Section 179 election on an amended return without IRS consent for tax years beginning after 2014. So we have that Rev Proc there on your screen, Rev Proc, Rev Proc 2017 33, uh, which put that rule in place. Again, I just want to bring up the state impact of the revocation of the 1031 exchange treatment for uh, personal property because it would seem since the tax code in Iowa is pointing at the federal tax code as of January 1st, 2015, Without legislative action, IRC 1031 would continue to apply to personal property exchanges for purposes of determining Iowa income. Now, like I said earlier, I fully expect Iowa to not couple with the expanded Section 179 and the bonus depreciation, but the 1031 exchange for personal property would seem a little different. So, you know, we'll just have to watch and see what Iowa does with that. So Iowa taxpayers right now can generally expense up to 25000 and then depreciate any asset acquired in a trade under a regular makers, but they will definitely see significant differences between state and federal tax income in a year where they have to recognize large amounts of 1245 gain. So that's if Iowa couples with federal treatment of not allowing um, 1031 treatment of like-kind exchanges for personal property, we'll see some significant differences between um, federal and, and state um, taxable income if people are applying large amounts of bonus depreciation to wipe out the 1245 recapture. Mm -hmm. So just another consideration and something to watch in the state house. I wanted to take just a minute to talk about how the new law impacts vehicle depreciation because I know you have a lot of clients, they go out, they buy new vehicles, and so it's just important to kind of see what the law did with that. So the amount of the depreciation deduction for luxury automobiles, okay, so those are just basically your, your passenger vehicles and vans and trucks that, that are under that 6,000 pound limit. Uh, for 2018, the, they've increased the Tax Act, Cuts and Jobs Act increased the amount of yearly depreciation deductions for those luxury autos. And so that amount is $10,000 for the first taxable year, $16,000 for the second taxable year, $9,600 for the third, and $5,760 for each succeeding taxable year. Now, for 2018, the amount for passenger cars and vans and trucks less than or equal to 6,000 pounds, they're the same. Now, you might have thought, well, where's our two different uh, depreciation schedules? Because we've always had different depreciation schedules for the vans and trucks as compared to the passenger um, cars. And the reason is because um, the inflation inflation adjustments haven't begun. They won't begin until 2019. So the law has specified the same amount for both, which is always where we start. And then the reason why we've had different uh, amounts in, in the past is because IRS applies a different inflation adjustment to truck chassis autos. And so that's why our vans and trucks have always had a slightly higher amount. Um, so I would expect that IRS will do the same once the 2019 um, inflation adjustments come out. But again, we'll just have to watch for that. Another thing it's important to realize is that the Act kept the $8,000 limit for additional first-year depreciation. So even though we now have 100% bonus for these um, passenger cars and trucks and vans, right, that are less than or equal to 6,000 pounds, uh, you are only still going to get $8,000 additional for the bonus depreciation. So beginning in 2018, in the first year, the taxpayer can deduct $18,000. So we go back to that chart that shows because the law increased the first year deduction to $10,000. And then with the bonus, you can add 8,000. So you're looking at $18,000 a year beginning in 2018. 
However, there's another issue with this that's not quite clear cut, but I'm going to point it out and we'll be putting more information out on this as, as it becomes more clear how it's going to work. Further depreciation reductions are not straightforward if you put bonus into play. We have to go back to the last time that we had 100% bonus and there's, there's a, a provision in the law that, that I'm not going to go into right now, but it's likely that if you take the $18,000 uh, depreciation in the first year, it might not be until year six that your client will be able to take further depreciation deductions. So it's just a, a little funny thing in the law that, that we'll put more information out about that. But again, that only has to do with those uh, passenger cars and trucks and vans that are at six thousand pounds or below SUVs and trucks above six thousand pounds your clients are going to be happy with you because if they so choose if they if they so want to the hundred percent bonus applies to both now new and used SUVs and trucks if those vehicles were purchased and placed into service after September 27 2017 so that's a big change um, the $25,000 section 179 limitation, you know, for the SUVs, that cap is retained, but if you have 100% bonus, it really becomes a lot less impactful. So just something to consider um, that 100% that, that, that bonus applies to new and used. Now, what about your passenger auto pur purchases in 2017 for the ones that aren't over 6,000 pounds. I just wanted to put up here to remind you what the depreciation deductions were. We had a different schedule for the passenger cars, as I said, as from a different one than for the light duty trucks and vans. And so, you know, because we still are at that $8,000 limit, uh, it still applies the same for purchases September 28th and forward. However, the difference is that um, the bonus will apply to used purchases. So that's the one difference with respect to purchases made after September 27th when you're talking about the luxury um, automobiles. I also, while we're on the topic of depreciation, want to mention that we did get a new farm depreciation provision and that begins 2018. So as of January 1st, new farm equipment that's purchased can be depreciated over a period of five years instead of seven. So our farm equipment um, depreciation schedule has been for seven years for some time now. This act allows the new depreciation or the new equipment, and, and, and it has that provision in there that says that the original use has to it has to originate with the with the taxpayer, um, and you can use five years. It also for that equipment removes the requirement that the property be depreciated using a hundred fifty percent declining balance method. So that requirement is gone as well. And these provisions apply to property placed in service after December thirty. 1st, 2017. Okay, so that's enough of what's really going to be um, things that you, things dealing with depreciation and some considerations that might come into play as you're preparing 2017 returns. What we're going to move toward now is looking at more business planning issues for your clients and just sort of addressing how the new law impacts both corporations as well as pass-through businesses. So you've all heard that the, uh, the, the Act permanently lowered the maximum corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. And that begins right in 2018. Now, one thing to point out, fiscal year C corps get to apply a blended rate. Um, you get to, so if, you're, if your uh, tax year crosses over between the different years, uh, IRC section 15 has a provision in there that, that talks about how that works, but basically you're going to get to take advantage of the new rate for that portion of your tax year that is in 2018. One thing that we want to really look at when we're talking about the, the decrease in the corporate tax rate is to remember that the old law actually was a graduated 
um, system. So even though we always talked or heard about this 35 percent corporate tax rate that didn't apply to everybody. We still have a number of small C corporations out there dotting the countryside. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed every day really at how many of those are still around, still viable, and many of those have incomes of less than $50,000 a year. And that's a significant number because if your taxable income under this new law is not over $50,000 you used to have, I mean, you, you will have the 21% tax rate. But this chart, this is the old, the old law that I've put up here just so that, that you can recall. The old rate for someone with, with less than $50,000 of income was 15%. So that's going to be a huge tax rate increase for our small C Corps. So this is a business planning consideration. If you know you have clients out there that are operating as C-Corps and you know that they've historically kept their income down, um, you need to talk to them about possibly converting over to an S-Corporation. Of course, that has a lot of um, implications as well, a lot of things to consider, um, but it's definitely a conversation that needs to happen and a consideration that needs to be made. Now we're going to move into a topic that has a lot of questions, and it's a it's a it's a section in the law that is just the more you dig into it, the more complicated it gets, and the more that you see provisions that you're just not really sure how IRS will interpret, and that's our new IRC section 199A deduction. So we're going to spend some time talking about this. Um, we've heard a lot about it being a 20% deduction, but this new deduction, it, it should really help a lot of business clients, um, but it's very complicated. And it has lots of different limitations and just figuring out how IRS is going to interpret all of these limitations is going to keep all of us very busy for a long time. So I'm looking forward to all the pages of guidance that we're going to get. Hopefully this year we'll get a lot of it so we can start actually knowing exactly what we're dealing with. But today we're going to give you a general overview of how the provision works, where some of the big questions are, and we're also going to talk about a rather controversial provision in the farming community dealing with the qualified cooperative dividends. So to start, I'm just going to start with the basics here. The, the, the Section 199A deduction is at its start a 20% deduction, right? And, but again, like I said, it's subject to many limitations. And the law says that it applies to qualified business income received by an individual through a pass-through business. So if you're operating on a pass-through basis, that means that you pay individually for your business income that you receive. So it goes on your 1040. So that's going to include your S corporations, your partnerships, and your sole proprietorships. So this is who gets to take advantage. Perhaps, we'll see, not everybody gets to take advantage of it, but this is the starting point in trying to figure out if you qualify for the 20% deduction. It also separately, and I want to draw it out like this with the two bullet points because it's important when you try to figure out how to calculate the deduction, how the law kind of draws a line. So we have what I call the QBI or the Qualified Business Income Section 199A deduction. And then we also have a 20% 199A deduction that applies to qualified cooperative dividends, real estate investment trusts, and qualified publicly traded partnerships. And surprise of all surprises, the deductions calculated differently for all of these things. So it's just gonna be so much fun for us all to figure out um, not only how the law is written, but also how IRS will interpret it all. Now, unlike the corporate rate tax provision, right, the decrease of 35% to 21%, is permanent for corporate corporations, C corporations. There's no sunset on that. This new uh, section uh, 199A deduction, this is effective only through 2025. So it's just like all those other individual provisions. It will uh, will wake up in 2026, and this deduction will no longer be in place unless Congress passes an extender bill down the road. 
So to understand the first part of the deduction, the qualified business income deduction, which I sometimes will call the QBI deduction, you're going to have to start with the net amount of qualified items of income, gain, deduction, and loss. We have to look at what is qualified business income, right? And that's how a law defines it, the net amount of qualified in items of income, gain, deduction, and loss with respect to any qualified trade or business of the taxpayer. And so what you exclude from that definition you see are the real estate investment trust dividends, the qualified cooperative dividends, and the publicly traded partnership income. Why? Because those are calculated separately. So those aren't going to count toward your qualified business income. Also, QBI, or qualified business income, is going to exclude any wages you receive. It's going to exclude reasonable compensation you get as an S corporation shareholder. It's going to exclude guaranteed payments, interest income, dividend income, or capital gain. That's how the law is worded. So your QBI is essentially going to be your net business income, subtracting all those other things. Now, to be QBI, you have to be connected with a U.S. trader business. So that's important. That's part of the law. It's kind of part. Um, people often say that 199A is like a new DPAT deduction, Section 199. And so you'll see some of those things pulled in from the Section 199 deduction that has gone away now. There is a separate calculation for each trade or business of the taxpayer. So this is one of the big questions we have, right? We've had different grouping elections put into place for Section 1411 and some other things, and, and we just don't know. The law doesn't tell us enough to know whether or not grouping is going to apply in the same way for purposes of calculating the, the new QBI deduction or not. So that's just one of those things that we have to wait for some guidance. But essentially, like I said, since QBI, qualified business income, is calculated as net business income, in a lot of cases it's going to be like this. So a farmer, you'll look at the net schedule F income, and you, you subtract out the qualified cooperative dividends, and that's essentially going to be your, your QBI. Um, it also, because it looks like, from, from what we can tell, the law specifically says gains are included in your QBI, and it specifically excludes or takes out from the definition of QBI capital gain. So it does appear, unless IRS decides to, to, to change this in a regulation or to make it clear that this does not apply, First pass appears that 4797 recapture, which is ordinary income, would be gain that fits the definition of QBI. So it would seem that you'd be able to include that when you're calculating your QBI. Also, for the most parts, you know, your net schedule C, your net schedule E. We're going to look at rental income, but in most cases, it looks like, first read of the law, you know, without regulations, that, that most rental income should count as QBI. Capital gain is specifically excluded. I think that should include 1231 gain as well, since it's treated with capital gain rates, but that's not what the law says. So we, again, we have to wait and see what IRS does in terms of how they interpret it. Um, just pointing out that the, the language of the statute does not mention 1231 gain. Um, so that's just one of those areas that IRS will have to interpret. I did want to take a minute to talk about rental income by itself because again this is a this is an issue we're not we're not certain how this is going to play out but it does appear that rental income generally is going to fit within the definition of QBI when we get down the road today we're going to talk about the wages limitation and at the end they inserted a new test within the wages limitation that that appears like it was created simply for people who are, are landlords with real estate investments. So, you know, it seems certain that the rental income generally is going to be part of QBI. The, the key that, that comes from reading the, the code, though, is that it has to rise to the level of a trade or business because that's what, that's what you could deduct under this new deduction, right? Your net income from your trade or business. So if you want to know what is a trade or business, 
you know, one of the key cases that comes to us from the U.S. Supreme Court is Commissioner versus Gretzinger. It's an older case from 1987, but it really sort of lays out the rule. It just has to be conducted for income or profit and engaged in with some regularity or continuity. So a lot of us, when we think about rental income, especially in the farming context, we're so used to thinking about, oh, is it, are we materially participating or are we actively participating? Well, to be a trade or business, you, you don't have to have either. Um, you can be in the trade or business of renting property. There's no requirement for uh, material or active participation under this new deduction. So it would seem, unless IRS decides to give us some bad news down the road, that cash rental income, for example, would likely be considered um, trade or business income that would be uh, subject to this new 199A deduction. Now there might be some exclusions for some isolated rental arrangements, right? If it's, a, if it's an isolated arrangement where you just rent something here short term, it's not something you typically do, then I can definitely see that that would not likely be considered to be a trade or business. But that would seem to be where the line is drawn. But again, we're gonna need guidance from IRS on this whole issue. Even though we've had this issue out there in terms of what's a trade or business for decades, we've never really had great case law really um, defining the boundaries of that. And so this new law might actually uh, be cause for defining those new boundaries and we'll just have to see. Another issue that we really have no idea well, what's gonna happen with is self-rental. So you can read the law and you can read the code and you can say, well, there is really nothing in here that would seem to exclude self-rental income from being included in the definition of qualified business income. But just um, prognosticator here, and this is just uh, my personal thought, I kind of suspect IRS might have other ideas, but we just don't know. That's, that's an area we need to wait for IRS to give us guidance as to whether self-rental income is something that we'll be able to include um, in the definition of QBI. So that said, that's sort of the, the general overview of what qualified business income is. And so we're, we're defining what it is for the purpose of trying to figure out how we're going to calculate our deduction. So I'm going to try to keep this at a high level and as simple as possible because this code will take you in a tangle and you'll be confused and be scratching your head. But generally the new deduction is the lesser of what the code calls combined qualified business income, which is the lesser of 20% of your combined, of your qualified business income or this wages limitation, or 20% of your taxable income. And when you calculate your taxable income, you have to take out capital gain and qualified cooperative dividends. So you essentially see there are two limits when you're talking about a 20% deduction, it's likely not necessarily going to actually be 20% of your combined, of your qualified business income. Because the first thing you have to look at is, are you paying out W-2 wages? And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about this wages limitation. And so don't, don't fret, we'll go through the examples. And the second thing, it's going to be limited by your taxable income. You're not going to be able to take more of a deduction than 20% of your taxable income minus capital gains minus qualified cooperative dividends. Now one thing about this wages limitation that we talk about, it's not going to apply to any of your clients with an income above the threshold. And there are two areas where this new income threshold applies. The first area is for determining whether you're gonna be subject to this wages limitation. And the second area is to determine whether or not your service businesses can take advantage of the deduction at all. And when we're looking at the wages limitation, if you go back up and look at my two bullet points here, you know, when you're trying to look at the lesser of, right? The combined qualified business income, that, that amount, it's either your 
20% uh, of your QBI, or if you're subject to the wages limitation, you have to take the lower amount. If your taxpayer makes less than $157,500, you're not going to have to worry about it at all. And if they're single and, and, and the next $50,000 of income, they'll be able to have some of the benefit without having to apply. So it phases out. So we're going to look at that in detail. But this slide here is just to sort of give you the starting point of where we're going. And don't worry if you feel confused. Um, I think it'll clear up as we go through the different provisions. So let's look at what we mean by the wages limitation, right? And so remember, this only applies for people who are above the income thresholds. So again, that's 157,500 for single taxpayers and $350,000 for married filing jointly. So most of your clients aren't gonna have to worry about this wages limitation and many of them will just be able to take 20% of their QBI limited by 20% of their taxable income as their new 199A deduction. But for those who make over, you have to worry about whether or not you're paying out W-2 wages. So this is um, a holdover from the old DPAD deduction. So many of you realize that DPAD had this W-2 wages limitation. Now this, this one's gonna be a little different because at the end they added something different to accommodate uh, real estate landlords. But this same provision applies in terms of a requirement that we're not going to want to give you this deduction unless you're actually paying out wages. And so um, let's look at a simple example without the wages limitation first and then we'll kind of look at how the wages limitation works. So now we're just looking at an example, basically, how are you gonna calculate this qualified business income deduction? So let's just take a single taxpayer who has income below the threshold. Her, she's single, her income is below $157,500. So let's say she has taxable income of $100,000, 44,000 of that are wages that she earns from a, from a second job, 68,000 of that is QBI, right, her net income. Maybe she's a farmer. This is essentially going to be maybe, like I said before, her net Schedule F income minus any cooperative dividends minus her $12,000 standard deduction. So for all my examples, I'm going to assume the standard deduction. We're not going to mess with itemized deductions. In this case with Jana, we don't have to worry about the wages limitation. She is not a services business, let's just say that. And so her 199A deduction is going to be the lesser of 20% of her combined um, business, her, her qualified business income, or 20% of her taxable income. Now notice in this case, since she has extra taxable income, which comes from wages, she is actually going to take get to take the full amount of 20% of her qualified business income, or a $13,600 deduction. Now let's look at what happens. How does the wages limitation operate? Because this is this gets a little more complicated, and we could do a whole uh, webinar on this for multiple hours. So we're just going to give an overview of it. In this case, we're still dealing with a single taxpayer, non-service business. Let's say he's a partnership cash rental income. Let's just say that cash rental income counts as QBI, and he's in a partnership, so he pays no W-2 wages, right? He doesn't have any employees. Taxable income for James is $210,000, and that comes from $222,000 in qualified business income minus a $12,000 standard deduction. So when you're looking at James, he's going to, uh, his 199A deduction is going to be the lesser of 20% of his tax, of his QBI, right? So we're not even going to go through the trouble of calculating that. Why? Because he doesn't pay any wages. And so because he doesn't pay any wages and he's way above the income threshold and the phase out, he's not going to get a deduction at all, okay? So the second bullet point here uh, underneath the 199A deduction illustrates how this wages limitation applies. So that it gives you the two parts of the test, right? So when you're talking about the wages limitation, it's either 50% of the W-2 wages for your trade or business or 25% of W-2 wages 
plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis immediately after acquisition of all qualified property. What's qualified property? It has to be tangible and it has to be depreciable. So if you just own land, like James here, he's just cash renting farm ground, he doesn't have any property and so he can't fall under that second limitation either. So in some cases, you're going to have some clients who may not pay a lot of W-2 wages, but maybe they're a real estate landlord with lots of, um, maybe they have some depreciable property that they can um, count that, that we can we have basis in that property. And if that's the case, then you're going to get 25% of your W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the basis in, in, in the property that you have too. So that's just a, a, a technical thing in the law that, that's going to apply for some taxpayers. And so in James's case though, he doesn't get to take advantage of that because he pays out no wages. Now let's look at what are wages, right? Because does everything qualify? And so what the law says is it points you back to a pre-existing section of the code, section 6051A38. And it's those amounts paid by such person with respect to employment of employees by such person during the calendar year ending such taxable year. Ah, that makes a lot of sense, right? A couple things I've investigated just because I've gotten questions and thought about it. If you, if you track this code back, wages is not going to include commodity wages. So if you have farmers who have been paying those out, um, you might want to reconsider that if the wages limitation is an issue for you because commodity wages does not fall within the definition of wages for purposes of the 199A deduction. All right, so we have people. Let's just kind of keep track of where we're at. People below the income threshold, remember, they, they can take the 199A deduction and it's going to basically be equal to 20% of their qualified business income. If they're above the limit, the, the income threshold, then they have to worry about the W-2 wages limitation. Then now we're going to turn to a second big limitation for a lot of people, and that is this deduction does not apply to specified service, trades, or businesses. And boy, if we knew exactly what, what that meant, we'd be a lot better off too. But as you'll see, we're not exactly sure what this is going to mean either. But the last thing I need to point out when we're talking about specified service trades or businesses is that this limitation doesn't apply either if your income is below the threshold. So if you're following here, if we have clients who have income less than $157,500 if they're single or $315,000 if they're married filing jointly, they're not going to have to worry about this limitation either. So what's their QBI? What's their deduction going to be? It's going to be 20% of their QBI limited by 20% of their taxable income. So all these limitations, the W-2 wages limitation and the specified service trade or business limitation only apply to those with incomes above the threshold. So let's turn to what is a specified service trade or business. Okay, what the law says is services in the fields of health, law, accounting, actuarial science, performing arts, consulting, athletics, financial services, brokerage services, and then it has this great phrase, or any trader business where the principal asset of such trader business is the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees. And so you see in, on your slide, I've crossed out engineering and architecture. That's because the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act pointed back to pre-existing 1202E3, and then it made some changes. And it said, we're going to point to 1202E3, except we're going to cross out engineering and architecture. We're not going to include those in this new law. And we're going to add in investing, investment management, trading, or dealing in securities, partnership interests, or commodities. Okay, so that's what we're left with to interpret. And I'll say we're going to need some IRS guidance on this because it really does sort of beg the question. We have, we have case law a little bit on Section 1202, but it's an obscure enough provision. We, we hardly have anything out there. We don't have a lot of tax court opinions interpreting this to really see. I think that the phrase that we're most concerned about what it means is, any trade or business where the reputation or skill of, 
of, of one or more employees is the principal asset, right? So does that mean that a um, plumber who is well regarded in, in his field um, would fall into this definition? I, I don't I don't expect that would be the result, but I don't know. And so I think this is one of the areas that is going to require some pretty clear guidance from IRS, where we're just going to have litigation everywhere to try to figure out who falls into this. Because it's a big deal, right? If you fall into this and your income's above the threshold, you don't get to take the deduction at all. So this definitely um, begs for guidance. So here's just a simple example. Mavis is a single accountant, $80,000 in QBI from her business. She has no other income. Accounting is specifically listed as one of the businesses that, that is a service business. So if Mavis had high income, she wouldn't be able to take the 199A deduction. But in this case, her income is below the threshold. So she gets to take a QBI deduction, and her QBI deduction is going to be the lesser of 20% of her QBI, which is $16,000, or $13,600, which is her income minus the standard deduction. So she's going to actually net, in this case, you see what a difference it makes, almost $3,000 in tax savings because of this deduction. Um, even with $80,000 of income. So it can be a significant tax saving device, this, this new deduction. So now I'm gonna to turn to the really uh, controversial section for those of you with agricultural clients. You might have already had a lot of questions regarding this because this has been a very confusing and a very difficult issue. Because essentially what uh, the law says is it has a separate provision for calculating the 199A deduction for qualified cooperative dividends. It's a provision that if you looked at the early committee report, even the one that came out early, it wasn't in there. This was one of those provisions that was thrown in there at the very end. And now we're sort of reaping the whirlwind from that late ad because what is the net result of this is that this provision as written significantly favors sales to cooperatives by their members over sales to non-cooperatives or sales by non-members to cooperatives. And so we'll look at the details of exactly um, where the distinction is or why this advantage exists. It appears from the fallout from the senators that have been interviewed, from the from from the kind of the fallout of when everybody realized what this provision actually says and does, that the discrepancy was unintentional. So we'll talk about what's next. Um, I, I expect that there'll be some sort of a fix. People are um, working toward that, but we're just simply not sure what's going to happen. So let's start with the definition in the code of what a qualified cooperative dividend is, because I think this is where the unintentional impact came into play. I really think, and, and Senator Thune from South Dakota has so stated, that he thought that this was only going to apply to patronage dividends, right? The small benefit that members get from dealing with their cooperative, that smaller percentage. So the idea was, okay, for any patronage dividend, you're going to have this special treatment, just like the REIT dividend and the, the publicly traded partnership income. And so he has stated that he thought that this qualified cooperative dividend provision was applying to those patronage dividends. But the law states that any patronage dividend as defined in section 1388A, any per unit retain allocation as defined in 1388F, and any qualified written notice of allocation it counts as, as a qualified cooperative dividend. What this means for those of you who have clients who, who are patrons or members of cooperatives, you know full well how their grain sales are reported or if they sell livestock type of thing. You get the 1099 PATR and in box three, essentially the gross sales from that grain sale are reported there. And that is considered per pin, per unit retains paid in money. This was a really big deal, right, under DPAD because that amount was reported to the patron. And then under DPAD, the cooperative had the option, it was in the cooperative's um, control, but they had the option of passing 
through the portion of D-pad that related to the patron's grain sales through to the farmer. And the other thing that was a big deal about that under the old D-pad is that uh, DPAD deductions passed through from cooperatives weren't subject to the W-2 wages limitation um, uh, under DPAD for the farmer because they could use the W-2 wages of the cooperative, right? It was all calculated at the cooperative level and then it was passed through to the farmer. So the reason why these provisions were sort of added at the last minute is when Congress talked about eliminating DPAG, cooperatives got very concerned. That was one of the benefits they could give to their members. And so if you're going to take that away, what are you, you, know, you going to give back in return? And so this was put in there. However, the definition of qualified cooperative dividends includes this, this per unit retains paid in money, which is essentially the income that the farmer gets from, for example, his or her grain sales. So the calculation of the 199A deduction for qualified cooperative dividends is totally different than the calculation for qualified business income. And herein lies the disparate treatment and all of the controversy. Here's what the law says. The, the deduction for a qualified cooperative dividend is the lesser of 20% of qualified cooperative dividends, period, or 100% of taxable income minus capital gain, right? So if you're following along and looking at that, 20% of, of, of per PIM is essentially 20% of your gross grain sales. That's where you start with your deduction. And then you apply that, your limit for this particular deduction is 100% of your taxable income, right? Remember our QBI calculation? It was 20% of your taxable income. Huge distinction on both counts. Additionally, there's no W-2 wages limitation for the deduction for qualified cooperative dividends. It doesn't apply. And I think that was a nod to the fact that most farmers pre-tax cut and jobs act could take advantage of the DPAD if their cooperative chose to pass that through. Whereas other farmers who sold to a non-cooperative, if they didn't have W-2 wages, they could not take the DPAD deduction. So that's the starting point of how that particular deduction now is calculated. Looks like my screen is frozen. Just a minute. See if I can unfreeze it. You might need a little technical assistance. <laughs> maybe I. Maybe that means I've talked too long. Hold on. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, here's the calculation. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so here's how you calculate it, right? $200,000 in grade sales reported as per PIN on box three of 1099 PATR. Let's say I have $150,000 in expenses. I don't have to subtract those expenses out from my $200,000 when I begin my calculation for the qualified um, cooperative dividend. I get to take 20% of the $200,000 and $40,000 is my tentative deduction. And then I just have to uh, limit that by 100% of my taxable income. Let's say the farmer did nothing else except sell this. Taxable income is going to include expenses, right? So I'm looking at $50,000 minus my standard deduction. And so I have $38,000 of taxable income. Well, if you're following, that means that my deduction is going to be $38,000, which is equal to my taxable income, which is why many people have said that this deduction essentially wipes out taxable income for sales to cooperatives by members. Now that's not always gonna be the case, but this is an example that shows how that might work in some cases. And here's just a quick example of how the two sales would compare, right? So in this particular case, you see that the same sale to a non-cooperative, and again, I'm keeping these examples overly simple, so we don't have any other income, we don't have capital gain, we don't have anything else that would actually change this calculation. But if you are a, a, a farmer selling to a non-cooperative or you are a non-member selling to a cooperative, you see that you get to take the QBI deduction, right? The qualified business income deduction, which is calculated based on 20% of your net income. So if you calculate the deduction for um, the non-cooperative sale, you're looking at a $7,600 deduction. Your final taxable income is still going to be $30,400.
Whereas with the example we just worked through for the qualified cooperative dividend, your final taxable income is zero, right? So don't get too worried about necessarily understanding this yet, except to, to see that, there, that when you've heard all the hullabaloo, there really is a big distinction. It really is a big deal. A lot of people are saying it's not fair. There's just a lot of question in terms of what's going to happen. So everybody's talking about a fix and you listen to the different associations. Some will say, oh yeah, the fix is, you know, we pretty much got it ready to go, but I don't know what the fix will look like. I don't know exactly how you change that exactly um, in a simple way at all uh, to, to have a more equitable result. So this is definitely more than a technical correction, in my opinion. What we've heard is that there's gonna be language tried to be put into that spending bill, right? The spending bill that's caused all the, the ruckus in Washington and shut down the government for a couple of days. And now we're, you know, we just got a continuing resolution was all, but hopefully we'll actually get our spending bill in February. We may have some language to fix this in that bill. Sometimes we can slip in a tax provision and everybody's so worried about other things that it doesn't even get much play. Senator Thune and Hoven, Hoven is the senator from North Dakota and Thune is from South Dakota, they sponsored this provision. They're the ones that got it in there. And they have both through their offices stated that they did not intend this result. And then the USDA came out with a, a press release that said that the federal tax code should not pick winners and losers in the marketplace. And they said, we applaud Congress for acknowledging and moving to correct the disparity. And our expectation is that a solution is forthcoming. So, you know, at this point, it looks like there's acknowledgement that this disparate treatment should not be there, but we just don't know what's going to happen. And so we're watching. I think in terms of what to tell your clients, right? So the big questions are, I'm going to pull on my grain. I'm not going to sell to ethanol plant anymore. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to sell to the independents. And the independents are saying you're going to drive us all out of business. I mean, this is a really big deal. It looks like there will be a fix. I would advise people to stay tight, not change their business practices. Don't go become a cooperative, right? That, that's the other thing everybody's been talking about. How do I become a cooperative? Um, everybody's going to try to become a cooperative if, if you can get this treatment for your members, right? I don't think any of that's going to bear out. So don't go to all the trouble of changing all your business practices until essentially the dust settles. So that's where we're at with that. I wish I had final um, final word, but we'll be watching it very closely. Just keep watching our website and we'll give you updates as soon as we hear them. And I spent a lot of time on that because that has been such a huge issue uh, in rural Iowa for lots of people. So it's important to kind of understand where, where we're at with that right now. We're just going to kind of spin quickly through the last things in, in the slides. You have the materials so you can kind of review them at your leisure. Um, if you have questions or, or thoughts about any of these things, please email me, email Christy. We like to hear from you. And, and we also like to hear from the field about things that we're not thinking about that we can investigate as well. So deductions for real estate investment um, trust dividends and uh, income from publicly traded partnerships is also, the deduction for that is calculated differently than that for QBI as well. Essentially, it's gonna be 20% off the top but the difference between that and the co-op deduction is it's going to be limited by 20% of taxable income. So there is a little difference. It's a pretty good deal for people who have real estate investment trusts. It's a really, um, it's a really generous benefit. Couple of things. There are changes to net operating losses. Uh, you're not going to be able to have a carry back from most businesses anymore, except the law does include a two year carry back for farming businesses. So we still have that, but everybody else's carry back goes away. And then net operating losses moving forward are limited to 80% of taxable income for those losses that are incurred after December 31st. There's also a business interest limitation, but I'll just point out that that only applies to businesses with revenue above at 25 million or above. So a lot of your clients are not going to have to worry about that. There's also a, a, a provision that applies to farming businesses where they can opt out of that, but then they have to use ADS depreciation. So that's sort of a big deal. 
The law has expanded cash accounting, so some of your clients that may not have been able to use cash accounting in the past may be able to. That's something you might want to explore. As we discussed, the DPAD is gone because this new 1099A is in many ways an expansion of the old DPAD. In many ways, it's different. The corporate AMT has been eliminated. Now, the individual AMT was retained, and, and as Christine mentioned, the, the limits are different and the phase-out thresholds are different, um, but we do not have a corporate AMT anymore. And then one other thing that's important for you with clients with those C Corp farming, those uh, farming C corporations that are still out there, Christy talked about meals, but we have that other category of meals, meals for the convenience of the employer, right? That was considered de minimis on the part of the employee and a lot of our farming C corporations, the employer was able to deduct 100% of the cost of those meals provided for the convenience of the employer on site. The new law reduces that deduction to 50%. And then after 2025, that's going to be eliminated altogether. So just a planning pointer, another reason why people probably really need to reevaluate their business structure in light of this new law to see if it makes sense. As you know, the, the basic exclusion amount, the amount you can die with and not be subject to any estate tax was doubled. But that's not permanent. It's only through 2025. In conjunction with that, all of the basis adjustment rules of 1014, those are retained. So we didn't lose our stuff up in basis. Portability was retained. So a lot, very few people are going to be subject to any estate tax um, during the next eight years. But again, that's not permanent. It's just temporary. And so that is, I guess we got pretty much to the end. We had to kind of hurry at the end. We have in your slides some call resources. If you're not familiar with our website or if you want to follow us on Twitter, we will definitely uh, keep you posted and be posting more information, fact sheets. Um, information regarding the new law and definitely as IRS comes out with new guidance on any of these provisions um, we'll be updating on that as well so it's kind of kind of like be a Christmas present every time the new guidance comes in to kind of see the questions we're going to get answered that that we've been wanting to get answered so thank you so much for joining us today uh, we will save the the questions in the question box and we'll be able to uh, Christy uh, Cronin from the Iowa Bar has been gracious to host this for us and, and she'll be able to get those to us and make sure to get those out to you um, sometime after this webinar so again thank you for joining us there's our contact information and good luck during tax season